Defense News is proudly sponsored by Navy Federal Credit Union. If you're a member of our nation's armed forces, the Department of Defense, or if your family is, we'd be proud to serve you too. On this episode of Defense News Weekly, the service branches are getting new top leadership across the board. What challenges will the incoming brass face as they take over? We look at how the Army, Air Force, Navy, and Marines are all looking to tackle diverse issues, ranging from recruiting challenges to overall force design and weapon systems that will define their futures. And later, want to learn how to shoot down a Nazi fighter plane like a World War II door gunner? We found the instruction manual. Stay tuned for that. We've got a lot to cover in today's episode, so let's get rolling. With the latest in news and analysis from the Pentagon to the platoon, this is Defense News Weekly. Welcome back to Defense News Weekly, I'm Andrea Scott. We have a special episode for you this week, a comprehensive look at near future changes coming to each of the service branches. New leadership is on its way for most of those branches. So how will the incoming brass shape their forces in the coming years? For analysis on the topic, our reporting team explains what lies in store. First up, the Air Force and Navy. Defense News' Megan Eckstein spoke to reporter Stephen Losey for insight how the Air Force is shifting toward an Indo-Pacific fight, and then dives into what changes are coming to the Navy. Hi Stephen, thanks for joining me today. So first let's talk a little bit about the Air Force. Uh, they'll be getting a new service chief, um, obviously quite a few questions as to where the Air Force goes in the coming years, you know, what their operations look like, what the big picture, you know, direction the force is going in. So what issues will the future service chief be grappling with in the next few years? The next service chief is likely going to continue the Air Force's strategy of shifting away from the uh, violent extremist fight in the Middle East towards a potential uh, conflict with a great power, such as in the Indo-Pacific region. And part of that has to do with modernizing the service's aircraft, adjusting its structure so it can more agilely respond to a um, diversified fight in the Pacific region and spreading out its bases or getting ready to spread out its bases under a concept called agile combat employment. So air bases are less susceptible to one big attack from a major power. Sure, and obviously to support that, the Air Force is likely going to need some new equipment, some new airplanes, some new weapons. What are some uh, major modernization and acquisition programs you could point to that the service chief will have to sort of figure out what makes best sense for the Air Force? That's right. One of the big ones is the contract for the next generation air dominance system, the sixth generation fighter that's going to replace the F-22 Raptor. Um, now, this is going to be the Air Force's first a new fighter since it brought on the F-35, but it's not gonna be a traditional fighter. They're talking about it as a family of systems. So there will be a crewed component that is roughly similar to a fighter, but there will also be autonomous drone wingmen, which the Air Force refers to as collaborative combat aircraft. And that's also going to be a very interesting modernization. Uh, the Air Force is working on laying the groundwork to bring on these so-called CCAs, and we could start seeing them ramping up that effort a whole lot in the years to come. The Air Force is also trying to, uh, they're getting ready to divest older Cold War era AWACS, the E3 Centuries, and replace them with uh, Boeing's E7, um, which Australia calls the wedge tail, which is gonna be the new uh, airborne uh, battle management aircraft. And, you know, lastly, are there any places where, you know, it sounds like a lot of these decisions are already in the works. Are there any big questions that remain for the Air Force, whether it's a procurement issue, whether it's, you know, just sort of operationally how they want to uh, be employed? Are there any big questions that remain that the next service chief will really have a hand in sort of determining the path forward? I think the, uh, the next service chief is going to have to decide um, how to prepare for um, such a potential conflict if a, if a fight with China comes in uh, later this decade, as some, uh, as some observers fear. 
he's going to have to figure out what to do about um, uh, positioning fighters at Kadena Air Base. Right now, they're bringing back their older, um, worn-out F-15Cs. The Air Force has got to figure out whether um, it wants to or, or and can stage a permanent fighter force there, and um, how and, and what to do about um, getting ready for uh, getting ready for NGAD, getting ready for CCAs. How to incorporate these autonomous drone wingmen in everyday operations. Great. You know, the, the U.S. Navy faces some pretty similar issues in terms of looking to this uh, peer fight in the Pacific, um, distributing forces, trying to make themselves uh, less vulnerable to enemy attack while also kind of optimizing the advantages that they have. Um, and there's some pretty big issues that the future chief of naval operations will have to grapple with. Um, one of them has been, you know, the Navy is very clear that submarines are their, you know, they call it their asymmetric advantage. Um, they really want to double down on their undersea warfare. Uh, however, there is a serious problem in the submarine industrial base right now. Um, the Navy and Congress have been throwing a lot of money to try to bolster um, the supply chain to address some workforce issues. Um, but currently, you know, the Navy is asking to buy two submarines a year and industry just can't deliver those. Um, so the next chief of naval operations is really going to have to figure out, you know, the ideal situation would be to buy even more submarines to double down. Um, but can the industrial base support that? So I think we'll see some very interesting things as it relates to submarine warfare um, with who uh, the next service chief um, trying to, to grapple with the direction they want to go in versus what's realistically possible. Um, another modernization issue, you know, you talked about the role of robotics. The Navy has sort of this vision of eventually achieving a hybrid manned, unmanned fleet. Um, there's some early entrance into the fleet right now in the air and in the water. Um, but I think we're really going to see some big decisions coming up. Uh, you mentioned NGAD for the Air Force, uh, Next Generation Air Dominance. The Navy has a similar program um, that they've kept sort of secret, secret squirrel to this point, but uh, really seems to be sticking to its timeline. I think the Navy really aggressively wants to get out this fighter uncrewed aircraft teaming arrangement. Um, so I think we could see the next service chief double down on that. Um, and then looking to, you know, your traditional manned ships on the water, um, there's been some question as to, you know, the Navy really likes its destroyers, but it's a big platform. Is that the right platform? Um, the replacement for the current destroyers keeps getting delayed and delayed and delayed as the Navy figures out what role it's going to play in future operations, what industry can build. And so I think the next chief of naval operations is really going to have a hand in understanding what that aspect of the fleet looks like as well. When we come back, more from our team on changes coming to the Army and Marine Corps. And later, think you could hit a Nazi fighter from a door gunner position on a World War II era plane? See if you have what it takes. Welcome back to Defense News Weekly. Next up in our special analysis of changes coming to the U.S. military, our reporting team looks at the Army and Marine Corps. Defense News' Megan Eckstein tells us about how the Corps is looking to adapt and brings in land warfare reporter Jen Judson for a look at what's in store for soldiers. Check it out. So joining me remotely today, we have Defense News land warfare reporter Jen Judson uh, to talk about the Army. So Jen, the first question to you, um, you know, similar to the other services, the Army is grappling with some issues as to what they want to be, how they want to operate, what they need to do in the future to really, you know, move away from the ground wars in the Middle East and prepare for what's coming next. So what issues do you think the Army will be grappling with in the coming years? And what does that mean for the next Chief of Staff of the Army? Well, Megan, first of all, thanks for hosting this discussion. Uh, but to get after that, that question, I'd say the Army has developed a rather robust picture and plan of where it wants to be and, and how it wants to remain relevant amid the changing nature of warfare. Uh, so the Army knows it has to adapt and modernize beyond what it developed during the Reagan buildup uh, and what it rapidly designed for counterterrorism and counterinsurgency operations. And the service has struggled over time to modernize its force, but now has, has a clear path to bring new equipment and weapons in by the 2030s. And it's planning to get 24 new systems into the hands of soldiers by the end of this year, 
um, fully fielded uh, and fully fielded most of a set of 35 new systems by 2030. And so this includes long range precision fires, it's top priority, next generation combat vehicles, future vertical lift aircraft, a new adaptable network to connect everything on the battlefield, uh, air and missile defense capabilities, and new soldier systems like the integrated augmentation, uh, integrated visual augmentation system or IVAS, and a next generation squad weapon, just to name a few. So everyone in the Army leadership is, is driving to get as many of these programs to the finish line. And the next Army Chief of Staff, the, the nominee is current Vice Chief of Staff, General Randy George, is, is already deeply engaged in this process. Perfect. So to support that vision of future operations, what are some of the major procurement efforts the Army will undertake? Um, and, and kind of how can we expect to see the future Chief of Staff of the Army really influence these procurement decisions and sort of optimize what the Army is buying to help with this uh, operations that you've just spoken about? Well, I, I teased it out a bit earlier, but the Army is focused on a wide variety of procurement efforts. Uh, it's prioritizing long-range precision fires, including a long-range cannon, a precision strike missile with an over 500 kilometer range, a hypersonic weapon. Uh, they're trying to design a new optionally manned fighting vehicle uh, to replace the Bradley Infantry Fighting Vehicle, procure two new future vertical lift aircraft and an attacked reconnaissance aircraft and a long-range assault aircraft. Uh, they're designing a new network new integrated air and missile defense capability, a variety of soldier systems. So General George, if confirmed, brings with him a lot of Middle East deployment experience. Um, he's clearly an infantry guy through and through, and so he'll bring a deep understanding of the maneuver force. He also served as First Corps commander and has a robust knowledge of how the Army will fit into the Pacific from theater from that, from that job. Um, with that said, he'll likely be interested in seeing how programs like the optionally manned fighting vehicle will flush out, he understands a great utility that long-range precision fires will have in theaters like the Pacific, so he'll likely influence the paths of procurement for a variety of longer-range uh, fires capabilities. You know, and he understands the utility of a network that can tie systems together across vast distances and that can operate in degraded environments, um, longer-range helicopters. Um, it's also likely he'll be very much on board with developing capabilities for logistics operations in contested environments, you know, having served in, enormous, in an enormous and complicated theater like the Pacific. Well, thank you, Jen, for joining us. So on the Marine Corps side, they're in the midst of this big overhaul of the force. It's called Force Design 2030, uh, started by the current Commandant General Berger, and really looking at taking the Marines from a land warfare centric force to something that can be much more agile in islands and beaches and really optimize themselves for a potential fight in the Pacific, but also be applicable to other places. Um, you know, you think the Baltic Sea, you think the Mediterranean, other bodies of water um, where you could have some island hopping, some, you know, beach warfare. Um, and this has really made them rethink about what they need, what they need to buy going forward, moving away from heavy things like tanks that are hard to transport and really leaning in on unmanned systems that can gather targeting data, unmanned systems that can launch anti-ship missiles. Um, so General Berger really got the Marine Corps off on a good path, but this is meant to be an iterative process. So the next commandant of the Marine Corps is really gonna take the progress of the past four years and have to continue innovating going forward. Um, what are gonna be the latest and greatest in loitering munitions? What's gonna be the latest and greatest in command and control, not just stitching together um, spread out Marine Corps forces, but pulling in naval vessels, pulling in Air Force aircraft, um, really bringing the Marine Corps to a prominent role in the joint force. Um, and so to do that, we're looking at a lot of upgrades on the command and control side. I really think that's where we're going to see the biggest effort um, and the biggest focus area for the next commandant. Um, but also considering, you know, not just how can we gather data for the rest of the forest, but in the cases where the Marines are the only ones on hand, how can they you know, complete the kill web, right? So um, looking at getting into the anti-ship missile game, looking at even getting into anti-submarine warfare potentially. Um, so I think there's some really interesting problem sets that the Marine Corps will be facing in the next four years. Um, and the next commandant is really, I think probably gonna have a lot of fun <laughs> kind of grappling with some of these bigger issues. Um, so speaking of the joint force, uh, Stephen, you have covered General C.Q. Brown for the past couple of years in his role as the Chief of Staff of the Air Force. He's already been nominated to serve as the next chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. 
Um, and some of what he's previously spoken about with his vision for the Air Force really lends itself to an idea of how he may approach leading the Joint Force. What have you heard from him in the past? So um, I mentioned his Accelerate, Change, or Lose effort. That's uh, something that uh, is trying to um, overhaul the, the structure of the Air Force and the makeup of the aircraft and other and um, other components of the uh, the Air Force and to get it ready for a conflict in the um, in the Pacific region and part of that has to do with increasing the amount of interoperability uh, between various weapon systems the Air Force is working on a thing called ABMS the advanced battle management system that tries to tie together a lot of these uh, aircraft uh, and other other systems so they can uh, better track targets, better share data more accurately, more swiftly uh, hone in on where a, um, a fighter or a bomber needs to, needs to strike and, and share that data. That's going to come in, uh, come, in, come in handy to a great degree in a potential war in the Indo-PACOM region. And it would also make it easier for the Air Force and Air Force aircraft to talk to other services, work together with other services, and um, General Brown's vision was essentially endorsed uh, by President Biden in the ceremony where he uh, announced the nomination of General Brown to be the next chairman of the Joint Chiefs. Uh, President Biden mentioned Accelerate Change Lose and said, General, you're right on. So you can count on that being essentially marching orders from the commander in chief on how all the services will need to operate in a conflict going forward. Well, that's all we have time for today. Thanks to Stephen and Jen for joining me today to talk about these topics. Thank you. We'll be tracking all these stories as they develop over the year. For Defense News, I'm Megan Eckstein. When we return, our financial expert is back with her latest tips on how to consolidate debt for easier payoff. Welcome back. On this edition of Money Minute, Navy Federal Credit Union personal finance expert Jeanette Mack gives you tips on consolidating debt to help get it paid off. When it comes to paying down debt, the sooner you take action, the better. The average American carries more than $50,000 of debt, and there's no time like the present to take control of those finances by consolidating your debt to get you on track and meeting your financial goals. Whether you get a consolidated loan or a balanced transfer or tackle debt one loan or card at a time, there's a strategy to paying down debt successfully. Pay more than the minimum. Doing that chips away at the principle of your debt and saves on interest. Also, try the debt avalanche method. Pay off your highest interest rates first, then the next highest, and so on, until all your debt is paid. Or use the snowball method. Put your extra money toward your debt with the lowest balance first for quicker gratification. If you did a balance transfer or a loan, put all your high interest debt on that card or pay off your debt with your loan and have one monthly payment. Not sure which strategy is for you? Talk to a personal finance counselor to help make a plan to reduce debt. And most of all, know you can take control of your life and your money. Thanks, Jeanette. We'll see you next week. To get more coverage of military and defense topics, align your super secret surveillance satellite toward Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marine Corps Times.com, as well as DefenseNews.com. And to be the most up-to-date drill instructor screaming at the recruits, sign up for our Early Bird Brief newsletter compiled each morning to bring you the latest headlines. It's also an audio. Check out the podcast version out each weekday, wherever you get your podcasts. And if social media is where you get your news, follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And stay tuned. When we come back, we see how World War II door gunners learned to shoot down Nazi fighter planes. You didn't know this was information you needed, but we promise it's worth it. Don't go away. Welcome back. Have you ever seen footage in a movie or documentary of a door gunner trying to take down an attacking Nazi fighter? Did you assume they just aimed at it and squeezed the trigger? Turns out that's not even close. In this footage from the National Archives, we get a look at the training video used to teach gunners how to actually hit an incoming fighter. 
and we promise it's strangely captivating. Check it out. This plane is manned by the luckiest crew of the luckiest squadron of the Air Force. Their waste gunner is Trigger Joe. With him at his post, they can fly anywhere with complete confidence. For a gun sight, he uses a crystal ball. He fires by instinct. Yeah, I'll say they're lucky. Lucky to be alive. Never mind that crystal ball trigger. He didn't have one. He didn't need one. There's science in that kind of shooting. A fighter has fixed guns, all facing forward. To aim his guns, he must aim his plane. He's like a flying gun. In any type of attack, the fighter must aim at the spot where you will be by the time his bullets get there. In order to continue to fire at you, he must fly a pursuit curve. This is the time he is really dangerous to you. This is the time he is easiest to hit. There are five parts to a fighter's attack. Overtaking, turn in, roll through, gun sparing, and break away. Now he is your target. To you, he will always appear head on. Not this, not this, but this, and this, and this. He's in his curve, head on, in range, shoot. Shoot? You know why you missed? You didn't allow for the forward motion of the bomber being imparted to the bullet. Oh, yeah. Uh, what was that? Remember when you were a paper boy? If you tossed the paper directly towards the porch, it went sailing by and lit next door? The same thing happens when you shoot from a moving plane. If you fire point blank at 90 degrees, the bullet continues to move in the direction you're going and will go off here. The paper boy never understood why, but he soon learned he had to aim at this side of the house for his paper to land on the porch. To hit this plane on the ground then, we must do the same thing. Make allowance for the effect our bomber's motion will have on the bullet. Now, if he is moving toward us, our point of aim must be such that our bullets will intercept him. But what happens if we put him in the air, where he's free to change his course and keep firing at us? As we move forward, he must change the angle of his approach. This is his pursuit curve. We apply the same principle of deflection we had for the moving plane on the runway. As long as he stays in his curve, we know where he will be and can intercept him. Uh, paper boy, deflection over here on a bicycle. Yeah. Just remember, the deflection is always between the target and the tail of your bomber. But you have to make an I've got it. I've got it. Now watch this. Between the Joker and my own tail. Let's see. About here. Hey! What the hell, Doc? You're starting to get it. Starting? Brother, I got it! Your direction was right, but you had no correction of your deflection as the approach angle changed. Uh, for instance. All you see is his movement in relation to your position in the air. He appears to slide towards your tail. I ain't seen nothing like that either. How about this? That I've seen. All right. This is just a bird's eye view of that attack. Here's the way you see it. Oh, yeah. Here's the 90 degree position as you see it. Now here's how you aim. Using the 35 mil radius of your gun sight as a measuring stick, the proper deflection is three rads, or three times the radius of the gun sight. One, two, three. There. That's where you aim for 90 degrees. Uh, how do you figure that? Oh, you want it established mathematically. Very well. 1,000 times the quantity 1 over V sub 0 minus V sub T sine 90 degrees over 2 V sub 0 squared times V sub G sine 90 degrees minus 1,000 times V sub T sine alpha over V sub 0 times the quantity 1 plus A rho V sub rho V sub 0 equals 100 mils. Equals 3 rads. So it's 3 rads at 90 degrees. What next? Here's one last tip. As soon as he gets in range, fire a two-second burst. Check your angle and fire another two seconds. 
Remember these three points. Shoot only when he is attacking you and in range. Aim between the target and the tail of your bomber. Estimate the approach angle and apply the correct deflection. Now that's the story. Think you can do it? Certainly. Give me a plane. How about taking one full speed? Okay, why not? First I gotta identify him. He's enemy, all right. Looks like the same guy. Yeah, maybe I'll get him this time. Now he's coming in, gotta line him up, check the range, estimate approach angle, towards my tail, 90 degrees again, three rads over here, down here, statue, not too much, not too much, not too much, not too much, about a rand and a half, so he's gonna get keep the rhythm. Look, Trigger, look at the plane. <laughs> it works. Well, I'll be a sad sack of... Rads. That's all we have time for this week. Please visit us on MilitaryTimes.com and DefenseNews.com for more coverage. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next week.